visualization. Part two, or three, or four, or something like that. Today we're talking about visualizing bivariate data, which means we are going to visualize the relationship between two variables. Well gee, what's a relationship? Good question. A relationship means that a person's score on one variable means there is a greater chance of having a particular score on a second variable. Oh, like if you're seven feet tall, you're more likely to weigh 300 pounds than if you're six feet tall. Exactly. Or in mathematical terms, the prob- hey. Or in mathematical terms, the probability of being 300 pounds given that you are seven feet tall is not equal to the probability of being 300 pounds. As opposed to, if you are seven feet tall, you are no more or less likely to like like ice cream. Or in mathematical terms, the probability of loving ice cream, given that you are seven feet tall, is about the same as the probability of loving ice cream. Got it? E gats, that's all good and stuff, but how do you determine that visually? It's almost as if I pay him to ask these questions. How we visualize the relationship depends on whether we are looking at the relationship between numeric and numeric variables, categorical and numeric, or categorical and categorical. We're actually not gonna cover how to visualize categorical and categorical variables today and we probably won't this semester. Ah, shucks, disappointed again. I'm a man full of disappointments, what can I say? And then in the multivariate class, you can learn how to visualize multiple variables at the same time. Golly goosers, this is just fun. But first, numeric on numeric. The graphic of choice to use when doing numeric on numeric variables is called a scatter plot. And with the scatter plot, on the x-axis we put one variable, and on the y-axis we put another variable. Simple enough, right? So this graphic right here shows you that if somebody, this particular person has a height of 65 inches and a ice cream liking score of, oh, I don't know, 2.4 or something like that, or 2.25 or something like that. So it's just... You get it? No, not really. Ah, that's all right. Just indicating that their X score, and then you triangulate their Y score, and that dot represents what that person scored. Oh, I get it now. So now we know what all those dots mean. How do you know if there's a relationship? How you know is if there seems to be a elliptical shape going on in the graphic. So here's an example of a elliptical shape. We are looking at the relationship between height and weight. Notice that there is a higher probability of dots being in the high weight area above 200 for those who are tall, and there is a higher frequency of low weight values for those who are shorter. And sometimes it's a lot easier to visualize what's going on if we add a line to it. So let's look at the regression line. So this is what we call a regression line, and you can think of it as a line that is going through the densest parts of the data. And so again, if we're envisioning that there is an elliptical pattern, we can think of the line going straight through the center of that ellipse. So that's an example of a linear relationship. Again, we're looking for a gradual increase in y as x increases. Now let's look at an example of no relationship. So here we have a graphic showing the relationship between height and ice cream liking, and notice that there is not a general pattern of more values of ice cream liking for higher values of weight. So if the previous relationship looked like an ellipse, the current relationship looks like a circle. Make sense? Which indicates that as you increase on X, your probability of scoring a particular value on Y could be high, could be low, or could be somewhere in between, and we really don't know. And sometimes it's super helpful to actually overlay a line, a regression line, so we can see that. And here's that same plot with a regression line. Let's look at another example, shall we? What about this? What do you think is going on here? So we've got the relationship between stress and performance. Well, kind of hard without a regression line. Let's go ahead and add a regression line. All right, well that seems to indicate that there's little to no relationship between stress and performance. But, uh oh, we've been deceived. Look at that. And with that, that shows you one of the greatest limitations of regression lines. By definition, regression lines have to be straight-ish. Footnote for the pedantic. If we assume the relationship is straight and it ain't straight, we are only deceiving ourselves. So we know when we're looking at a scatter plot, we're looking for an elliptical relationship. We don't want a circular relationship and we want to see an overall trend, but we have to be careful because regression 
assumes that the line is going to be straight, and if it ain't straight, then plotting the line ain't gonna help us, it's just gonna be deceiving ourselves. So what other sorts of things are we looking for? One is bivariate outliers. You may remember from our univariate distribution discussion that outliers meant we had a concentration of scores in the center-ish, and then one or two or three or a couple different scores that were like way far away from the center of the data. Likewise, with bivariate relationships, we have certain data points that just don't fit the pattern that the rest of the data points do. So here's an example, again, looking at the relationship between height and weight, and we have this pesky little data point up in the top left where somebody is really short and really, really heavy. And so what this does is it makes it look like our relationship is actually much weaker than it is. So on the left plot, we have the regression line, which appears to be pretty flat because it includes the outlier. But on the right, when it ignores the outlier, it's actually a much stronger relationship. So bivariate outliers are data points that do not fit the pattern of the rest of the data points and they tend to make the relationship look weaker than it actually is. Second thing to look out for is influential data points. Influential data points heavily influence the regression line. In other words, if we were to remove that data point, the regression line changes significantly. So in this example, we have on the right, the relationship without that influential data point, and on the left, we have the relationship between height and IQ with that data point. So it's just because of that one person, that really tall, really intelligent person that made everything look like there was really a strong relationship when there really wasn't. So again, influential data points heavily influence the regression line. Oh, I see why it's called influential data points. Clever name, huh? Next we have what we call high leverage data points. What are those? I was just about to explain it, dude. Give me a second. Jeez, can you believe this guy? High leverage data points are those data points that have really high and extreme X values. They may or may not influence the location of the regression line, so with or without, with or without, it might still look straight, look about the same, but it will influence the statistics that we use, the fit. For example, the correlation coefficient, which we'll learn about shortly, the R squared of the model, those sorts of things. And here's another example of a high leverage data point, and this also happens to be a very influential data point. So this value of nine on X heavily influences the shape of the regression line, and if we did not have it, it would significantly change the shape of the re regression line, making it both influential and high leverage. So let me be candid with you. Here's the thing, visuals are great, visuals are awesome, visuals are intuitive, but they have a massive limitation. It is super easy to participate in confirmation bias. Because sometimes you might be tempted to look at a regression line and say, hey, yeah, there's something awesome there. Look at me, I'm gonna be famous. Pulitzer Prize, Pulitzer Prize, no. Nobel Prize and all, yay. We might be tempted to see something that's not actually there. Fortunately, we have many, many tools at our disposal to help prevent us from participating in confirmation bias. Number one. Regression lines. Well, didn't you just say you could be deceived with regression lines? Absolutely, if the relationship is non-linear. But if it is linear, then regression lines are actually super helpful to let you see whether the trend is going up or down or just flat. But like I said, they have to be straight. Otherwise, they are misleading. Tool number two, lowest lines. The relationship isn't straight, whatever shall we do? Not to worry, we have other tools we could use. In situations where we suspect the relationship might not be straight, or, or even if you don't suspect it and you just wanna check, we can use what's called a lowest line. And there are actually two spellings of lowest, L-O-W-E-S-S -S and L-O-E-S-S. -S. And I'm not gonna go into the technical details because it doesn't really matter, but basically what a lowest line does is it fits a regression line for the first part of the data, then the second part of the data, then the third part of the data, fourth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it does that throughout the entire range of the data set. And then at the end, it just connects the dots. And so it gives us a line that is allowed to bend with the data. And ideally, lowest lines stay within the densest parts of the data. Care to see an example? Oh boy, do I. So here are three plots showing the relationship between height and weight. The first plot shows no fitted line. The second plot shows a regression line and the third plot shows a lowest line. 
Notice how the lowest line is able to bend with the contours of the data. And by the way, if you use my Glenn Mod package or my Pfeiffer package, depending on what software you're using, the package is going to default to a lowest line, and that's what I prefer. Why do you prefer that? Because I want to make sure the line is approximately straight before I even think about doing regression. Oh, that makes perfect sense. You bet it does. Now, one thing to be careful of is sometimes lowest lines are a bit too sensitive. Sometimes they follow bends that really they don't need to follow. Sometimes they pick up on curves and bends that really aren't there. They're just noise. And in a coming video, I'm going to show you how to alter the sensitivity of a lowest line. Aw, oh, man, I wanted to learn now. You just wait, good sir. Tool number one was regression lines. Tool number two was lowest lines. Tool number three is transparency. Sometimes the data are so dense, it's very difficult to see how many data points are in a particular area, and it really mucks up the visuals. So what you can do is you can make it easier to see by making them transparent. Here's another graphic of the exact same data, but the data have been made transparent. Boy, that looks a lot clearer. Oh, you bet it does. As an alternative to transparency, we could also sample, which basically means we tell the computer to randomly draw scores from a hat. And again, I will show you how to do that in a later video. Have to wait again. And that about wraps up this video. Aw, oh, shucks, I was having so much fun. Oh, the fun never ends here in Statsland. Right, you are. So with that, let us review the objectives. Understand how to interpret a scatter plot. Understand confirmation bias and how it affects our ability to interpret graphics. And understand how statistics can help us. Understand what a lowest curve is versus a regression line. Know the benefit of trans transparency and sampling and graphical analysis and when we would use both. And finally, identify the following problems. Nonlinearity, bivariate outliers, influential data points, high leverage data points. So with that, we'll see you next time.